year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, man, how you doing? Today's Thursday, Thursday, November 10th, 2022. Tonight, Linda Moulton Howe. Let's do this, man. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR and the Game Changer Network. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing tonight? That's right. Tonight, we welcome very special guests back with us, Linda Moulton Howe. It's going to be another open conversation tonight with Linda and I. You know how uh, you know how Linda and I do it. We we have plans, and then we just drive drive the car off the road, and that's that's what we're going to do tonight. We'll see where we end up tonight, Linda Moulton Howe. And uh, and then that's it. Normally, this is a Thursday, and I, you know, and I would say that this is Wednesday, and tomorrow night's Fader night. No, no, then it's the weekend, and I haven't had a real weekend off in in quite a long time. So, uh, and as everybody knows by now, um, I'm getting over a cold. Today, I'm I'm 99. percent You can tell my voice is coming back. I've got the energy. It's all good. So, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a great show tonight. And then I am going to kick it this weekend and uh, relax and 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 not work. I'm not going to do anything this weekend. I got a, You know what I did? I got a robe. I bought a I bought a thick terry cloth thick robe. I haven't worn it yet. And uh, threw it in the dryer with a sheet of bounce. Got it all fluffy and wrinkle-free, and it's hung up. And I have got plans for that thing this weekend. <laughs> I'm going to put that thing out with some slippers, and uh, and that's it, man. I'm going to do that for three days. It's going to be awesome. It's gonna, I'm, I'm telling you, that's my plan. I'm going to deliver food. Just it, it's cold outside. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kick it, oh, man. And Monday, yeah. Let's see what condition I'm in on Monday. Right, right. Coming up, I'll be hosting and emceeing the Conscious Life Expo this February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton. Linda Moulton Howe is going to be there. That's right. And uh, come and hang out with us. Tickets and info right there. The link is below us, ConsciousLifeExpo.com. And then um, uh, two short weeks after that, Saturday, April 1st, 2023, I will be hosting the Parapod Festival at the Hyatt Regency in Valencia, California. This is a live one-day media event. It's a film festival. It's uh, an awards festival, podcast, media. So, if you're a content creator, paranormal, supernatural, you've got a series, you've got a documentary, whatever you've got, submit right now. The links are below pod, pa, uh, pod, <laughs> parapodfilmfest.com. The links are below. All right. So get your submissions in now. And then a week after that, I'll be, be heading out to sea. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I will be hosting and presenting. <laughs> the Hidden Secret Seminar at Sea Cruise. Uh, Scott Walter's going to be there. Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Baby and Chave. And uh, Third Stone is going to be there with the robe. That's it. That's the robe that I got. That's me in that robe. Very well done, Third Stone. 
Very well done. Links for everything that I'm doing, um, including the new TV series, Into the Vortex. The links are below. Just click. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. You can follow Linda at Earth Files right there on Twitter. The sandbox is hashtag gift 2 b on Twitter. And uh, hello to everybody out there. Okay. Ah, oh, man, I'm excited. Linda's here. Hey, you know what? You know what's strange? It'll probably be the uh, first question out of the gate with Linda. We we were just together like two weeks ago, and it, it's uh yeah 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 this is this is awesome, and uh, I just want to continue uh, where Linda and I were with our brains. Uh, we were having some very very interesting conversations and, and, and hopefully tonight be able to wrap some of that stuff up. So that's what we're going to do. Linda will be with us at the bottom of the hour. All right. We've got some crazy breaking news today. Um, centering around Alex Jones, Alex Jones was temporarily blocked from transferring any assets or spending money other than for ordinary living expenses by the judge overseeing the Sandy Hook defamation trial in Connecticut. The judge, Bellis, said in the one-page order, quote, with the exception of ordinary living expenses, the defendant, Alex Jones, is not to transfer, encumber, dispose, or move his assets out of the United States until further order of the court End quote. Now, as if that wasn't enough. Now, what's uh, what's ordinary living expenses at that level? I, I I don't know what that means. Is that ramen noodles, right, and bottled water? That's all you can spend money on. I don't know. You know, gas to take your kids to and from school. I don't know. I don't know what that is. But shortly after that, Judge Bellis then ordered Jones to pay an additional $473 million in punitive damages for lies about the Sandy Hook shooting, bringing the total judgment against Jones to almost $1.5 billion. And that's incredible. Last night, I mentioned uh, Zach Bagan's documentary, Demon House. And uh, got a bunch of email about it today. And I went uh, and did a little bit of a deep dive. So I thought I would share this with you. It's pretty interesting. All right. Check this out. Zach's documentary is set to be resurrected once again following Netflix $65 million bid for the rights to the movie. That's right, $65 million. That's because back on January 24th of this year, 2022, seven companies, including MGM and Miramax, made bids for the movie package, with Netflix winning out to produce the story behind his Demon House documentary. Production has already ended, by the way. Filming is complete, and its new title is The Deliverance. And the budget was around $30 million. Now, you have Oscar nominee Lee Daniels, known for producing major pictures such as Precious and The Butler. He'll be directing, which will star Andra Ray, Monique, Glenn Close, Omar Epps, Rob Morgan, and Caleb McLaughlin. Now, here's the crazy part. Zach bought the Demon House for $35,000. Now, what is unclear with everything that was available to me is the $65 million negotiation Was that with Zach? Because it says they're remaking his movie, Demon House. So was that with Zach or was that with the family? Who negotiated the $65 million? It's it's absolutely incredible. Now, it looks like uh, it's in post-production right now. And the release will be sometime early 
2023. All right. I'm going to keep everybody posted on this. It's a good documentary and uh, I do recommend it. All right. And more crazy news today. A large section of the destroyed space shuttle Challenger has been found buried in sand at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean more than three decades after the tragedy. Now, NASA's Kennedy Space Center announced everything about the discovery earlier today. The piece is more than 15 by 15 feet. It's likely bigger because part of it is covered with sand. And because there are square thermal tiles on the piece, it is believed to be from the shuttle's belly. Now, how did they find it? Divers for a TV documentary that was being shot spotted the piece back in March while looking for wreckage of a World War II airplane. There you go. Now, uh, they don't know, by the way, uh, what they're going to do. So for now, the piece is still submerged uh, on the bottom of the seafloor, the ocean floor. Um, They don't know how they're going to remove it and what they are going to do with it once they do. But all of the families involved in the tragedy have been notified about the location and discovery of this piece of... uh, it, the, the thing is, uh, the piece of Challenger, uh, the thing is they, they also don't want it damaged and they don't want the location revealed uh, as well. So the announcement was today and I'll keep everybody posted uh, as to what's going to go on. Now, yesterday during Fader Night, uh, one of the callers um, asked me about Artemis and what the updates were, right? That there were two or three delays, and that was correct. And we talked about that briefly last night. And then today, we got this press release. NASA has decided to reschedule its Artemis 1 mission launch to November 16th, quote, pending safe conditions for employees to return to work, end quote. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's Hurricane Nicole. Hurricane Nicole, which has made landfall in uh, eastern Florida, Hurricane Nicole has also delayed a SpaceX Galaxy satellite launch, pushing it back at least four days for a launch no earlier than November 12th. The Artemis 1 launch delay is the latest in a series of launch dates that have been scrubbed for that mission. It is to be the Artemis spacecraft's maiden voyage to the moon. Um, and, and other news on this, by the way, the Artemis rocket, this, this was built to withstand 85 mile per hour winds. They left the Artemis on the launch pad as hurricane Nicole rolled through. It had in excess of 100 mile per hour winds. And apparently there was no damage to the rocket, but that's was also the concern with um, all of the personnel and employees there um, at the Kennedy Space Center. So that's the latest update. And like I had said last night on the show, uh, there's other launches that are going on there. It's not just Artemis. Uh, SpaceX and other launches um, are always on a full schedule. And so when, when something gets pushed back, Everything either gets pushed back or something is going to get moved forward to keep everything else in place. And now that is the case with the SpaceX Galaxy satellite launch. Again, I will keep everybody posted, but it looks like today is the 10th. So six days from now, we may have the Artemis 1 launch back to the moon. Let's get this show cracking on this day in history. OTD 1975, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald sinks in Lake Superior, killing all 29 crew members on board. The disaster was immortalized in song the following year with Gordon Lightfoot's The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It's one of one of Gordon Lightfoot's best songs, by the way. There's a documentary came out last year, uh, Gordon Lightfoot. Absolutely incredible. Um, I, I, all new footage. Well, of course, it you know it's, it's a documentary, so it goes all the way back. But all the way up to this day, 
what's Gordon up to? You got to check it out. And, and, and this concert uh, that is there is incredible. Okay. All right. Here's your fader fact. Now, I didn't know this. Well, I don't know any of my fader facts until the fader facts are done. So, but check this out. All right. It's been vetted. Roman Catholics in Bavaria created a secret society in 1740. They named that secret society the Order of the Pug. That's right. New members had to wear dog collars and scratch at the door. And that is your fader fact. Look it up. Look it up. The Order of the Pug. All right. River Moon Coffee. I like my coffee, Doc. <laughs> Rivermoonwellness.com. Promo code F2B Blend. Gets you 15% off of your order today. Best coffee in the world. Go back, Lee Tappy. All right. All right. So um, uh, tonight we have Linda Moulton Howe on the show. And I wanted to talk briefly um, about the new show, uh, Into the Vortex. And without giving away um, stuff, because it, these are all network decisions, but uh, some photographs and some images have been leaked out, and, and those are out there now. So I can, I can disclose a few things. I don't know the schedule. But uh, I want you to stop and uh, uh, put this in your mind about who the guests are on uh, Into the Vortex, which is why, and I don't know who is appearing in which episode. Uh, new episodes come out on Monday. There's a new episode on Monday. I don't, I don't know what the episode is. But we have Linda Moulton Howe. We have Jacques Vallée. We have Avi Loeb. We have Scott Walter. We have Geraldina Roscoe. We have uh, Melinda Leslie. We have Adam Apollo. We have Jean Michael Godier. We have Micah Hanks. Uh, who? Um, Randall Carlson, and uh, and and others. The, the 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 best and the brightest, right? And I was I was talking about this earlier this week. How uh, Billy Carson is also on too as well. How um, when you're scheduling something like this and you go and you are in production and you're shooting and you're shooting all day long and I've got to have, uh, I have four different guests, four different subjects, four di different genres. Um, there's a lot of information. There's media and there's graphics and there's all of the stuff that has to happen. And, uh, it, and, and we're shooting this in, in real time, like it's a live show. So there's no editing later. And, um, but what is important here is that I, I just gave you a partial list of the guests and walking through the door up next, you know, I'm going to go change. I'm going to go do makeup real quick. And then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to sit down and I'm going from one brilliant guest to the next. And it was just an absolutely incredible run. And for me, um, what what is important here is that everybody that was on the show has been on Fade to Black many times. And what happens uh, because of that, and, and Linda is a great example of this, where you can go back to the first interview I did with Linda 10 years ago. You can go back and listen to that and then and and see how things you know changed over the years. And that happens with a host and a guest over time when trust is developed. The questions, if you have, you know, I'll use Linda as a, as an example. And she's coming out in a few minutes. She's, she's listening right now. She's gonna laugh. But I'll use Linda as an example. Let's say uh, it's your first time interviewing Linda, and it may be the only time, right? And, and you're going to go and you're going to ask Linda the same questions 
that Linda has been asked, or Richard Dolan, or you know, you know, pick the name, and it's the same questions because it's the first time that that host has done that. I did the same thing. I did it with all of my guests the first time because it's my first time interviewing them. So I'm going to go through and and the same question, Travis Walton, whatever it is, you're going to ask the Stan Friedman. You're going to ask those same questions. You're not, but the next interview is different, and then the one after that is different because you got all of those questions out of the way. And over the years, the trust that is built up between the host and the guest gets stronger and stronger, and I want to explore other areas. And let me tell you something. The guest wants to talk about something different, too, whatever it may be. And, uh, and so when, when we jump into something like uh, Into the Vortex, where I'm bringing on uh, guests that that I've got relationships with, I am able to, because of the trust between us, I'm able to ask the questions that I need answers to that I may not have had before, and I'm able to push it. But they, whoever the guest is, is cool with it. Because we have built that bond over the years. And that's what you are going to get with Into the Vortex. Now, I wanted to say this um, uh, about Linda really quick. I want to share something with you. Um, I have been asked many times over the years, many times, uh, people want to come up and, and they ask me, you know, what Linda's like. And, you know, they know that, you know, we, we hang out. And, but what was my favorite show with Linda? And, and you know what? It's an easy thing to answer. I have two. But my favorite show with Linda was the show that we didn't talk about UFOs. It was the Thanksgiving special. Do you remember that, Linda? Nod your head. Do you remember the Thanksgiving show we did? <laughs> Thumbs up from Linda. That show um, was, and, and for me, uh, was a show that Linda and you can go back and 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 listen to it yourself. It was a show that Linda and I talked about um, what it's like to be uh, a woman, a female presence in media and journalism, uh, to be a writer, to be pursuing this, and and what that was like throughout her career. And we went all the way back to the beginning and we discussed every phase of, of her career and we didn't talk about UFOs. So that, that comes from trust. And, and I can, I can assure you that, uh, that, that show, which was a three hour show that the, it was an opportunity for Linda to go there one, but two, she's never been asked these questions before. And, and that's, that's what you're going to get. And, and tonight, now the second, my second favorite, uh, and we talked about it two weeks ago, Jimi Hendrix in San Francisco. I'm just saying <laughs> Jimi Hendrix in San Francisco and 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 that story, which caught me by surprise, and um, I hadn't had that good of a time on Fade to Black like ever. And so tonight we're going to be doing all of that once again. Well, not Jimi Hendrix, but we're going to have an open conversation. Our guest tonight is Linda Moulton Howe. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I want you to check out Into the Vortex. It's amazing. It's an amazing guest list. The links for it are below. New episodes every Monday. The links are below. Go and check it out. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. And that's it. This is our last show of the week. So normally I would say tomorrow is Fader night. No, tomorrow is Jimmy in a robe binging a TV show. I'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us.
This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. I'll be the host and MC once again this year for the 2023 Conscious Life Expo, February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles, California. This is a four-day live event featuring hundreds of speakers, exhibitors, and not to miss special events. Check this out. Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, Daniel Sheehan, George Norrie, David Wolf, Sean Stone, Danny Brinkley, Susan Slaughter, the Leo King, David Palmer, Scott Walter, and another 200 inspirational speakers. Special events include a disclosure lunch with me, Expo's Got Talent, hosted by me, a seance with Susan Slaughter, the George Nori Forum, and the Leo King is going to DJ at a dance party. Over 200 exhibitors, over 200 speakers. It's the biggest event of the year. Tickets are on sale now at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. For everything you need, info, tickets, schedule, and speakers, please visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the UnXNetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the UnXNetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UnX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. Tonight, Linda Moulton Howe joins us. We've got a lot, a lot to discuss tonight. We're just going to start where we're going to start. We're going to end where we're going to end. Hopefully, we'll get it all in. Linda is a graduate of Stanford University with a master's degree in communication and has received local, national, and international awards, including three regional Emmys, a national Emmy nomination, and a station Peabody Award. She produces reports and edits earthfiles.com and hosts her live YouTube show each week with her cats. 
as well as being on Ancient Aliens since its first season. Ms. Howe has traveled to Venezuela, Peru, Brazil, England, Norway, France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Yugoslavia, Turkey, Ethiopia, Kenya, Egypt, Australia, Japan, Canada, Mexico, and the Yucatan, and Puerto Rico for her research and productions. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only, Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, good evening, young lady. How you doing? Hi, it's great to see you. And we really did have fun in that Into the Vortex. Uh, we, we went into the yeah. vortex for sure. Hey, um, check this out. You you don't know about this, but um, so Linda and I, uh, we wrap, we wrap the season and and we walk out and uh, Linda's doing her thing. She's getting her pictures taken. I walk the other way and I had, uh, uh, you know how it is there, Linda, right? So I got people around me and so somebody comes up and says, Jimmy, you've got <laughs> lipstick on your cheek. And I said, that's Linda, man. It stays. <laughs> <laughs> that's linda uh agape love to you yeah it was it was so awesome i was like don't touch it it's um but yeah and uh it was just uh, a wonderful conversation and and i do want to um uh i i've kind of alluded to this uh, uh a little bit ago but um linda and i uh, we're deep in conversation for two and a half days. Uh, you know, we did the taping, but we hung out and, and did stuff. And we didn't get a chance to. So what I want to try to do tonight is get back into that mindset where we were that weekend and continue some because I want some answers out of you. And uh, well, you were asking me questions, too. So maybe maybe we can uh, wrap up um, uh, some of that. And uh, now I, I did want to, uh, I want to get straight into UFOs, but I mentioned uh, the the bond, you know, between host and guest that you and I have uh, developed over the years. And that show that we did uh, so many years ago where we didn't talk about UFOs, we just talked about you and, and being a woman and, and, uh-huh. and, you know, predominantly, you know, journalism and, and media and and what it, um, th- that for me was one of the most interesting shows I've ever done. How was that for you to finally just, you know, break out and not have to discuss the normal topics and you were just free to, to share with us? Well, the surprise is that no one else had ever asked me about any of the struggles and contradictions and issues of being born in 1942 uh, being in grade school, junior high, high school, up to 1960, and then a life that when I think I've had one hell of a life, but I came into high school and college at a time where still women were not supposed to do a whole lot of anything, really. And when I think about getting into animal mutilations in September of 1979. The only thing that got me through all of it is that I love the pressure of fact. That is probably the strongest part of me. And wanting to understand what the hell was happening to those animals and why has driven the last 43 years of my life unendingly and having law enforcement tell me then that the perpetrators were creatures from outer space Mm -hmm. was the next piece that just, I wasn't going to let go of it. And it didn't matter to me what century, what decade, what men thought of women or not. I wanted to find out the truth, and that has what has driven me around the world in all of those countries. <laughs> you know, I I read this is this is a fact. I might have the year wrong, plus or minus a year, but it wasn't until 1974 that women in the United States could get a credit card without their husband's signature. Yeah. yeah. 1974. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, that that can't be right. And I was the only female in my class at Stanford University getting a master's degree 
in communications uh, in 1968. And, uh, well, 66 to 68, we graduated as a class in 68. So I was the only female, 27 guys and me, 28 in a class. And the thing that I learned very quickly was you don't whine, you do not complain, you learn one way or the other how to lift up heavy equipment. You don't ask any of the men to help you. You end up being asked to help them. And in a strange way, it set the tone for everything else that has evolved, that I have had a determination inside me to keep trying to find out what the facts and truth are about extraterrestrial biological entities interacting with this planet. Why do they bloodlessly, leaving no tracks, mutilate animals? Why do they take humans in abductions? And I pose those questions to you right now tonight, not as speculation. Those are facts. That is happening. It's been happening on this planet for a long time. And it leads right to the strange schizophrenia of what has been happening in the last few weeks about the government saying that they were going to come forward with reports about the evolution of investigating unidentified aerial phenomena, the new fancy words that are supposed to replace UFOs, but no one's letting go of UFOs. Right. And that when you look at NASA's announcement on October 21st, how discouraging, because there were the headlines that they were now also going to open up an investigation. And it sounded as if NASA, even though they know all about UFOs and ETs, right. they were going to join the support for getting information to Congress. Get this. When they put out their report, it said, quote, the study will focus solely on unclassified data. Well, it's discouraging because those of us who have been studying the UFO phenomena for decades, in my case, uh, going back 43 years, but the country has been exposed since World War II. And depending upon whether you start at 41 or 42, you're going back 85 years almost. And that until now, there have been extraordinary encounters with non-human intelligences. There have been reports by civilian and military pilots in the sky, ranchers and citizens on the ground. Those UFO, UAP and non-human entity encounters have also incl included people who describe being taken by non-humans into an alien spacecraft. And then after NASA announced that they had picked 16 people and that they were going to just focus on unclassified data, which is completely ignoring all of the data that has facts. That's it. Did that, okay, no, let, me, let me stop you right there. What did you make of that statement? Only unclassified when NASA is sitting on all the data that they would ever need to make an assessment, but NASA chooses to bring in 16 intellectuals and only review unclassified public information? It's exactly what happened in the early 1950s when Captain Rupelt, he was the first director of Blue Book, uh, he, uh, he also, he got into this and he reported in his book that what he was studying, UFOs, was, and this was his word, as a military a U.S. Air Force captain, that these were interplanetary. This was reported in the news. He wrote about it in one of his, uh, it was a 1956 book. And he turned around and he tried to say to newspaper reporters and people at the time, quote, that just like now and what we're experiencing today, they don't want to talk about UAP UFOs because they really, really don't know what the hell they are. That's exactly what's being said today. And that was one of the inside criticisms of people back then. A major Kehoe came to the conclusion that we were dealing with 
interplanetary beings and craft. So, and, and Philip J. Corso, Philip J. Corso, who worked uh, in the Eisenhower administration for General Trudeau, who was a good friend of Eisenhower's during the war. Philip Corso and I had a really uh, two very long uh, discussions together. One was an interview with Art Bell, but he and I talked at great depth. And he said, Linda, the internecine warfare in the Pentagon in the 19, what would have been the 1960s, he said it was so brutal and what it implied, what everything I've told you implies, whether it's Rupel, whether it's Kehoe, whether it is uh, Corso, no matter who you're talking about, who knew that there was all kinds of evidence for advanced technology and they get slammed back. It is because our government knew as far back as 1941 in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, that not only craft from someplace unimaginable to them because we had nothing like what they retrieved in Cape Girardeau, Missouri from a field, I think the date is in April of 1941. That's not provable, but we think that is the date. Right. And that it wasn't just a craft that was shaped like a wedge. There were bodies. It was two or three. And at that time... They brought in a priest, right? They gave him last rites. That's right. And he is the one who reported to his family with a photo that was taken by a camera that was described at the scene as having one of those big round, like the way they did cameras then, and the light would go off, and that somebody took the photo, and however they... Were, maybe it was a lab across the street. There definitely were no Polaroids at all. But the Reverend went home that night, told the story, and then ended up that the man who allegedly took that photo that night went to the Reverend and gave him a photo of these bodies in the craft. And his uh, young uh, niece saw this photo, and she has talked about it for the last three, four decades. But this means layer after layer after layer from 1941 at least. People who have been inside of the Pentagon and now those that are in JSOC. This is, they're the ones who are driving this. The Joint Special Operations Command. They have all of the secrets. They have all of the archives of all of the Navy and Atomic Energy Commission files that are underground in places like Suitland, Maryland. The Navy and the Atomic Energy Commission had all of the evidence that anybody would need that they were dealing with something that was not human. And all of their files are essentially buried from anybody having access. And so now we're in 2022 almost to be 2023. And we have gone through a kind of charade, a kind of watch this scarf over here while we're hiding this over here. Right. Reality is classified today. It has been classified for the last 80 years. And that leads me as somebody who has been exposed to what you would think would be maybe the underbelly that they, that, that they said, we can never tell the public animal mutilations and human abductions. Well, my God, they've been reported every year, every month, every week for years and years and years. There are estimates of thousands, uh, two to 3%, 4% of the American population in one of the Gallup uh, that Gallup survey that Robert Bigelow uh, uh, paid for and organized. And the people in the abduction syndrome are not falling apart in the street. The animal mutilations occur, but the number of cattle that are slaughtered every day to feed humans is so huge 
that the few uh, bloodless, trackless animal mutilations are this strange aberration that law enforcement say to me, Linda, the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And we know because we've seen with our own eyes a round light in the sky. We've seen beams come down into pastures. I interviewed a rancher in Colorado when I was working on a strange harvest. Would not go in front of a camera. But he told me privately that he had seen a beam come out of a light down into a pasture. It scared him so much that he ran back to his house. He said, I admit it, I, I'm embarrassed, but I ran back to the house instead of to the pasture. And he said, I waited for the sun to come up. I didn't sleep at all. He goes back to the pasture where he saw the beam. And there is the classic bloodless, trackless, mutilated animal. I, ha I have a question. Um, oh, by the way, they were called flash bulbs. I'm yes, <laughs> yes, the big yeah. flash bulbs in the, in the camera. You remember the little square ones and they would turn? Yes, yes. We're showing our age, but... Uh, that's all right. No, never. Don't ever even think about it as age. Yeah, no, think think like, about, like no, think about like if uh, if you have a really good good wine or uh, something that has to it has to marinate in itself and with ingredients for a long time. To me, if you look at the evolution of the numbers in your life that way, then you start getting into better and better and better levels. So, Absolutely. Well, it took me 10 minutes to marinate and figure out, remember flashbulb. So let's just <laughs> let's go with that. Um, it, but what is it that uh, is causing the delay we uh, the, the election is over, right? Here we are. It's November 10th. The announcement that was supposed to happen on Halloween, right? And, and here we are at the end. Of, now it's it's been two weeks. Um, NASA got the jump on ODNI with making the, their announcement. Um, what? Why? Why delay it uh, for this long? It's it's what I reported. NASA said. They had no evidence of UAPs. Uh, they basically were uh, saying, you know, there's really nothing here to see. And it's what Corso said, internecine warfare in the Pentagon. We're right. experiencing right. exactly the same schizophrenia. In fact, there was, um, I think that this was from the Hill. And uh, this was this week. And it's pro and anti UFO factions in government, it wouldn't be the first time. I read it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a great article, actually. The answer is that policies of denial have been recycling and cycling and cycling. And that whatever is on the other side of the people in the Pentagon and JSOC making decisions that when the public and the New York Times and people come and say, it's time to level on this, it's time to interview all these pilots who have seen UFOs and they know that it's not a glint off of a wing. They know that they are looking at a structured vehicle and they call it, it's not us. They do things that humans cannot do. They are in craft the humans have not made. Those are facts. That's where they should be starting with the dialogue now with the world public. Instead, it is the same energy and force that Rupelt and Kehoe and Corso and everybody has described that inside of our government is this war, an internecine war. They know that we're not alone. They know that there are extraterrestrial biological entities. They know that the, the entities are on a bell-shaped curve of friendly to neutral to hostile. Mm -hmm. is, is, so it's just wash, rinse, repeat, right? Yeah. Decade after decade? Exactly. And right now, the only perhaps fresh light at the end of the tunnel is that I now have a second person from a completely different aerospace background. I've, I've had one from a year ago. I have another who says, 
I've heard your report. Well, they will not go on the record. So I'm the intermediary on this. And sometimes that's a problem, but I'm telling you exactly what has happened. He said, we have heard your reports referencing your aerospace source about April of 2023 being a an impending change where the whole planet and the solar system is going to go through a different frequency, a different material in this little arm of the Milky Way galaxy that we're in. And that, that what they are expecting is that they, they will be able to handle an opening about we're not alone in the universe, that other life forms are here now, have been here for 270 more million years, and that they feel like that in the spring of 2023, that they're going to be ready to open up. And how are they going to do it? Two people a year apart have told me the same thing. They're going to use the James Webb is what I'm told. Mm -hmm. They're going to aim it at a solar system that has been high on the list of probable or possible life on one of the planets. And are we then, talking about, are, are, I want to jump in. Are we talking about Trappist? And if we are, one. Okay. okay. Uh, let me finish the question, young lady. <laughs> Be accurate, Mr. <laughs> if it is Trappist one, the fourth planet in Trappist one, if it is, was it, does, did both sources say Trappist one? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Now we're getting yes. somewhere. Yes. The, the information is the same. Okay. Now, uh, government can be so obstinate that they will change their plans just because there have been leaks and some of us are reporting something about April 2023. So God only knows literally what will happen. But but it felt, it, I would say that what I have been exposed to in terms of not only that description of how they would open up, we're not alone, because it will be far away it won't be something impending. It will be a biological signature. They will use the web and they've been showing us the web doing the wavy lines that deal with chemistry and physics. Biosphere. And it'll be a biological signature and it will be breaking news. Uh, the web telescope is now showing a chemistry that can only be produced by a living biological life form. Uh, headlines, whatever the headlines will be, uh, maybe life has been found in the universe, whatever it is. And for the insiders, they know that this has been there for these 80 years. And what is going to be on the other side of that announcement in terms of Pentagon, JSOC, government relationship with the American public to start out with because they need to say, we apologize to you. Those need to be their first words. We apologize to you. Our Here, intent, oh, wait, our intent was not to lie. Right. Our intent was to try to understand, and it has taken, taken us 85 years of this very complex subject to get to a point where we feel that we can stand in front of you and tell you the truth and assure you that nothing bad is going to happen. And how can they say that? It's because, as I understand it, we have a lot of help from the tall whites and the Nordics. Um, we're going to continue where we're leaving off when we come back uh, off of the break. But I will say this with an extreme amount of confidence that I have uh, a couple of sources. I'm not going to call them insiders because they're not. I have a couple of in, uh, sources that uh, work directly with the James Webb Telescope. This is an international uh, uh, project, the James Webb. It's not just the United States. Right. And that the, the Brain Trust internationally at, at 100% clip, all agree that there is a techno signature 
and a biosphere and an intelligent uh, uh, situation that they are intrigued about. And and they are convinced, like at 100% clip, Linda, that there is intelligent life in, in Trappist One. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. April, bring it on. And there will be a bunch of us at the Passport uh, to Ascension or Portal to Ascension in San Diego on the weekend of April 23rd, which is supposed to be the weekend on the JSOC planning table that they would like to open this up. And this these other scientists that have given me the information that part of this determination of when they would do this has to do with this fascinating story. I wish I could give you every detail, but the story is that they have had help from the extraterrestrials who have told them that there would be a point which ends up in April of 2023, where our solar system will be going through a completely different frequency part of this spiral around the Milky Way galaxy. And that when we enter it in April, there will be some kind of an energy shift. Perhaps the earth will itself, perhaps people and consciousness, that it will le start leaving some of this depressive, the issue of uh, autocracy versus whether we're going to live freely. It's, it's weighing everything. It's, it's really making people sad and out of it. Maybe the spring this coming year is going to do two things. Lift spirits and tell the truth. Finally. Right. I, I got to take a break right here. Let's get this in. Linda Moulton Howe. We're going we're gonna to pick up right where we're leaving off. Everybody just relax. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Linda Moulton Howe. April 2023. Trappist? Maybe? I think so. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. I'll be the host and MC once again this year for the 2023 Conscious Life Expo, February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles, California. This is a four-day live event featuring hundreds of speakers, exhibitors, and not to miss special events. Check this out. Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, Daniel Sheehan, George Nori, David Wolf, Sean Stone, Danny Brinkley, Susan Slaughter, the Leo King, David Palmer, Scott Walter, and another 200 inspirational speakers. Special events include a disclosure lunch with me, Expo's Got Talent, hosted by me, a seance with Susan Slaughter, the George Nori Forum, and the Leo King is going to DJ at a dance party. Over 200 exhibitors, over 200 speakers. It's the biggest event of the year. Tickets are on sale now at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. For everything you need, info, tickets, schedule, and speakers, please visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. 
Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. My main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Ray Sobs here, repping the X, and you're locked on to Fade to Black, Black. with my homie Jimmy Church. Powered by the Fader Dots and the UnXNetwork.com. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We're the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church tonight, Linda Moulton Howe. Another open conversation. Got to pick up where we left off, though. A very important uh, thread, mind-wise, uh, Linda, that we started to get into there. And uh, and I'm going to tie all of this back into Trappist 1 and... Um, and oh, oh, I, I did want to make this one comment. This is another uh, thing that I was told about the James Webb because it's international that the United States doesn't have control of the information and that if something does break, it's not up to the United States and that all of this information is shared. Right. Uh, I, I find that very, that was an interesting comment to come at me because my concern is, are we going to have, you know, uh, 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 you know, like contact the movie, right? As soon as we get a signal, boom, uh, you know, the government steps in and tries to wrestle control of the situation. But I have been assured that that, that that's an impossible way uh, to have things go down because of the international involvement. Now, here's the thing, okay? Just um, one footnote. Sure. They already know. They've been, oh, studying, they've no. been studying the right. solar right. system, the Trappist One solar system, for a long time. They know. They know so much about. Out uh, there are 168 civilizations. I have been told by people who have been working with the tall whites and the Nordics and they go in starships and we have logged 23 solar systems, possibly 28, having to do with the Nordics and the tall whites getting us out to certain solar systems, teaching us how to log what various solar systems and civilizations are like and that the Trappist, it's further out uh, from, say, Epsilon Eridani, which is only 10 and a half light years. Trappist is about 40, I think. And that we already have so much information. And when you talk with people who know and have been exposed to it, they, we're like living in some kind of uh, fantasy world. 
And now what I look at it is reality was classified in World War II. Literally, reality was classified. And now 2022 to 2023, coming up in April, is will be the first time that somebody or countries unclassify reality. And they're going to announce we are, they should say, we apologize because every human on earth deserved to know something as profound as other life in the universe. But if it happens in April, then all of the people who have wanted to use it as military leverage, that's the big change. Why? Okay, so why... Um, why the, le- I don't know if somebody's leaking, uh, from the Pentagon, uh, as you call it, the, the five walled building, the five-sided it, building. Yeah, the five sided building. I don't know if somebody's leaking information out, but the chatter started to go around, uh, the UFO community and then into the media that this report was going to, uh, wash all of this out and blame everything on China and that these are Chinese drones. Um, Now, do you think that the Pentagon would leak something like that out, or is this just misinfo, disinfo uh, being spread? I won't be surprised if they try it. But it will be another one of the buying times to keep from having to deal with planet Earth when they finally people are told the truth, that we're not alone. There are many civilizations. We already know it. We have people in uh, SEAL teams and other that uh, have been especially trained for going on these starships to go out. And that was something I encountered from two different military people when I was working on my Antarctica, Alien Secrets Beneath the Ice. And I was doing that in 2018. Right. They're telling me details that one had an uncle who would go on two year out missions on one of these starships. One is called the USS Curtis LeMay. One is called the Roscoe Helen Ketter. One is the Hoyt Vandenberg named after extremely important people who had, uh, we'll say heavy duty responsibilities in World War II. And they've been honored with these starships. And this is the reality in talking to those men in 2018, having nothing to do with the titillating headlines that we've been getting for the last year. Mm -hmm. And and one of them talking about his uncle. And sometimes people, the uncle had gotten the younger family member into the SEALs. And then I end up working with that SEAL on uh, Antarctica as Spartan One and his uncle when I was filming, was out in one of these uh, two-year missions. And to realize that reality could be so classified by people who have vested interests in keeping power on planet Earth, do not want to open up the extraterrestrial story because it complicates their ability to hold on to power. And what is that transfer to be? Money. The power brokers and the money on planet Earth are the ones who don't want this opened up. Why do you think if if the report and I think that all of us are are guessing because I don't think anybody has got any real information yet. um, But if it does do a flip flop versus what was revealed in August of last year in the first report, which was one hundred and forty four one solved, 143, we know it's not us, we know it's not China or Russia or adversarial, we're going to lump all of this in the other bin. If the report comes out and flip-flops on that, how is that going to look? It would suggest that they knew all along what that they just discovered in the last 300 days that China is invading our airspace and they have uh, advanced technology that we're not in possession of, that that won't make any sense. It's theater. It's more theater. It has nothing to do with the reality. It is right. class. If, if that happens, then somebody has made the decision that reality must continue to be classified. And there are a bunch of us who reject that. 
And the the other part, uh, I'm going to go back to NASA uh, for a quick second. If if they're dealing with unclassified material, right, and that that could mean a lot of different things. But don't you think that cattle mutilations and abductions then and eyewitness testimony uh, should be part of their review? If they're going to go unclassified, right, they're, they're, we, we can provide them with everything that they would need. I could do a presentation for a congressional committee that would include hundreds of slides, photos, maps, uh, testimonies, documents just me alone on animal mutilations and another one on uh, human abductions. I could probably go for five hours on human abductions. Well, my point is I'm one person who has for 43 years tried to get to the bottom of this. And I have a huge, huge amount of evidentiary material, but the people who really have what everybody wants to see, the craft, the bodies, technologies, uh, rods that uh, you point and they neutralize gravity used to make the pyramids. That isn't fantasy. That's real. And they've got all of this stuff underground. But Wright Patterson, Los Alamos, uh, Florida, Texas, everywhere. And if that's why to me, it's laughable. It's laughable if they don't go forward now with what they have set in motion to do, quote unquote, an investigation and then announce the results and that this time they would tell the truth. That- you, know, you know who the five should be? You, Richard Dolan, Whitley Strieber, Travis Walton, John Burroughs. The That'd five good, of you yeah. sit there and, and, yeah. and, and bring it. Yeah, I completely agree. But are the power brokers... And they are the ones who run the world along with, in the United States, JSOC from the Pentagon point of view. If they don't want even now to tell the truth, what is the real reason that goes beyond money? Because at this point, they've got it rigged so that power and money can continue to keep running the earth and they can introduce extraterrestrial biological entities, especially the ones that look like us, the Nordics and the tall whites, which are imposing and geniuses, but they still could be introduced with, these are our allies. Now, what happens then? I would wager I would wager that JSOC and people in the Pentagon and the NSA, CIA, all of those 17 intelligence agencies, they've already, they, every year they've done plans. They've had people assigned. What if we get a signal? What if we get a landing by extraterrestrials? What do we do? And every so often they probably change depending upon what else they have learned, they've been out to another solar system and they keep adjusting what they're going to say. To come up to 2023 and still try to pull off the, look at the scarves over here, while this is what's really going on. I don't think it can work anymore. In other words, I think that the manipulation has been played out in the last 12 months and that it's set up so nicely to use the James Webb telescope, find and confirm the biological signature and let that be finally the first truth. And then we go into a whole new space era and Would reality then be so threatening to these people in JSOC and the Pentagon after they made the the disclosure? And what I'm leading to is there are hostiles and those hostiles are supposed to be pretty awful. But that the Nordics and the tall whites are supposed to be able to handle it. And so there's, there's two levels to this story. One is telling the truth. We're not alone in this universe. We never have been. It's teeming with consciousness. All the things that 
Bones' work and everybody's work has said we're the the whole the whole universe, as I understand it, our government has known for a long time through a whole bunch of probably communications with ETs. The whole universe is conscious. Every mind in the universe has some interaction with the universe, whether it comes as that moment where uh, I can remember once in uh, Colorado uh, being at Channel 7 and having to go up to Aspen to uh, get, it, it was, I think it had to do with animal mutilations and an abduction. And uh, for those who may not know, there is a freeway that comes out of Denver and it goes up into the Rocky Mountains. And that's what I was on to go to Aspen. And it gets to a point where it is like this. It's it, very, very snaky. I had been on this road. I have going skiing and all dozens of dozens of times. Nothing Nothing about it, nothing was happening was at all unusual, except all of a sudden, like a thought voice came into my mind, literally pull over to the side of the road now. I heard this thought. And almost as if I'm watching myself do something that another part of me is, what the hell are you doing? But I pull the car over to the side of the, well, to the road onto the shoulder and I stopped. And I, I am shaken in the way that I'm doing something and I don't know why or how. When around the bend, which is where I was headed, comes a car doing 85 or 90 miles an hour followed by a huge, huge truck. And the car goes off, swims off into the air, and the truck, the drivers slam their brakes, and the truck, I would have been mincemeat. Two vehicles, a car and a huge truck, came around where I would have been coming around the curb if this pull over the car had not happened. I've had several things like that happen in my life. And when it happens, a lot of times people say, oh, God, it was so spooky. I don't even want to talk about it. No. That's how the universe we works. Should, we should be embracing this relationship. We should be listening. We should be able to talk with each other honestly about these events and encourage other people to listen to when something like that happens. And that the universe, I am excited about thinking that the whole universe is conscious and that it interacts with our brains through what Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose in 2014 wrote a paper about the fact that there was a discovery in brain tissue of little tiny micro, they called them microtubules, all over parts of a, a section of the brain. And Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose it is a hypothesis, a hypothesis that Homo sapiens sapien, what I think of as a genetic manipulation of DNA in already evolving primates by extraterrestrial biological entities those are words I read in that document at Curlin. We are somebody else's experiment. And that whether it's a natural evolution or because the extraterrestrials did it, we have a vibratory frequency relationship between our brains and the universe. Well, okay. Uh, I, I want to get this in before the break. So that's version one. You said that's one scenario. What's the second scenario? Um, tell me where I was when well, I you said you said the first the first one is that there is life in the universe and the universe is conscious. That's their first choice with oh. facing this. And then the second uh, scenario would be this planet in Trappist has oceans. Mm. 
nothing about life. It has oceans that right. you buy another 20 or 30 years to finally unfold that there are creatures on this planet. But, oh, my God, in the meantime, water. We know Mars had water at one time. Oh, we're now going to discover and report about the physics and the chemistry of watery planets. And those watery planets are on a path we will now, maybe, maybe we will find and it'll be another delay. Yeah, kicking the can down the down the field. But uh, you, I, all of us who are actually dealing with the facts that we are not alone in this universe, we should be seeing and feeling an entire population of the planet moving more and more and more toward that this, that there is not so much a revelation to the earth. No, it is a confirmation of what most of the people on the earth suspect or already know because of their own experiences in life. And that is another one of the differences between World War II and now. Uh, okay, let's, let's, let's say that they announce a biosphere, uh, a techno signature um, in, in Trappist One, and that's the announcement. Does the world accept that and move forward or does the world say well hold on a minute how long have you known about this or are we just going to just move from that date forward how do you think we're going to uh, take that news i think it'll probably be presented if it's if they're honest about what they have on that fourth planet at trappist one they would be able to say, we have used the last five years or four or whatever number they choose to confirm. So we have gone through investigative processes, but it was now Webb being out. We couldn't do this with Hubble. With the web, the web is what has made this possible for us to confirm. And now we can report and everything will be around this wonderful, wonderful telescope. And as far as I'm concerned, if that's what they feel more comfortable doing, it's fine with me. I think that they have known about the watery Trappist for a long time. Well, sure. I mean, <laughs> and uh, the amount of contact um, that just personally that I have made um, that has gone on in the civilian world, forget about the military world, um, the amount of contact that is going on, if that's what we're dealing with, I can only imagine the amount of information and contact that militaries and, and governments have made around the world. Yeah. You know, to say that we don't know, we're trying to figure this out, that's a load of BS. Yeah. And that is simply an untruth. Yes, absolutely. And the to me, they could make this so exciting if they would just apologize, first sentences, apologize, but explain, explain why they felt it was necessary for all of these years, from World War II to now, to keep everything as wrapped up as possible and only scientists, only doctors, only special intel people would be allowed to study or know anything about it because they did not know the consequences, they did not know if they were going to end up uh, with everybody being annihilated by something from outer space, like uh, the Hollywood movies used to do. Um, so if they just apologized for classifying reality for so long, and then said, now we are standing before you because you deserve to know the truth. And we can tell you with some confidence that we are working in collaboration with highly intelligent and advanced beings. And they have no interest in replacing humans. They are, they would like to see us evolve. They would like to see us stop being tribal and hatred. They want to see Homo sapien sapien that they contributed genetic manipulation to evolve into an advanced species on this earth that can go out into this universe beyond the Milky Way galaxy. I've talked to a man who had told me two years ago, Jimmy, and he described in some detail 
that he had been on one of those starships to Andromeda Galaxy. This should not be hidden. This should not be under the control of power brokers who are thinking, oh, we've estimated that our asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is worth at least $14 trillion in rare metals. We don't want anybody to know because we don't want anybody to be in com competition. This is now our storage for all of the materials we need to keep the computer world going. No, Earth should not work like that. No, it shouldn't. And, uh, and neither am I, because I'm going to take a break right here. <laughs> I'm going to get that in. Linda Moulton Howe is our guest. This is Fade to Black. This is just going to continue with where we're leaving off right now. Everybody stay right there. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Cartonel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens, the believer, alien encounters, hard science, and the passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day. As an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than in a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And 
so does the CIA. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ray Sobs, and I'm here to tell you about something I really think you're going to like. The Unex Network is a part of a larger group called Unex Media, and one of the things we offer is the quarterly Unex Magazine, which is available both in print and digital formats. This amazing magazine covers all aspects of the unexplained and makes for a great coffee table periodical that is certain to spark enlightening conversations in your living rooms. We invite you to check out the latest digital issue for free. Just go to unxnetwork.com forward slash membership and fill out your free membership with your name and email and become a new free member. The new summer issue is now available and the theme is Time Anomalies, which includes a feature article written by our managing editor, Lee Spiegel. Just go to unxnetwork.com Network.com forward slash memberships. That's unxnetwork.com forward slash memberships and get your free e copy of the Unex magazine today. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Back, fade to black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Linda Moulton Howe. But uh, I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to put Linda on the back burner because we've got another special guest coming in tonight. Linda. This is my Yoda. This is Fluffy, my Yoda, one of the most intelligent creatures I have ever known or lived with. This cat understands everything, understands English, knows all of the rhythms, comes to me when something needs to be done, and I get it. It's like telepathic from Yoda. It's uh, for people who don't have animals, and then you get one and you start listening to them, you know that telepathy works and that it can work between humans cats, dogs, animals, and it will work between other intelligences in this universe and us too. Uh, cats are proof, Linda, that aliens exist. They are they are here to have us take care of them. Yes. They, they, he's got you so manipulated. He's, oh. Look at that face. Oh, he's just, and his brother, his brother is almost twice as big as he is. Good. And is uh, chocolate chocolate, yeah, chocolate chocolate downstairs but uh the two of them together are like living with really smart people they really truly are fluffy fluffy doesn't he look like I, you know? he does. <laughs> That's uh, okay now let's 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 talk about uh, I mean, uh since oh, you have, i love you I since love you have a tall white uh with you right now <laughs> Um, oh. now, Linda, uh, uh, the tall whites. Yes. The, the, the chemistry particles are the same throughout the universe. Stars over here, hydrogen and gravity. Stars over here, hydro. There isn't, a, a, you know, some special chemistry going on throughout the universe. Amino acids are amino acids, basic sugars, RNA, DNA. That there isn't some special stuff going on physics is the same everywhere in another universe that's a different story in this universe we've got what we've got therefore the tall whites are are i don't want to sound biblical i don't want to sound religious but are we in their image the information that i have had 
from uh, a military aerospace, meaning been in the military and then working for a large aerospace corporation, that the progenitor of Homo sapiens sapien and the experiments with standing up primates, that would be Homo erectus up through Denisovan to Neanderthal to us. The closest progenitor are the Nordics. And they are the ones that look the most like humans, but forgetting for a moment that there are all the shades of skin on the earth, which uh, one man told me when I was doing uh, animal mutilation work and he worked for the government and we got into a long discussion. And I remember he said, one of the big puzzles to the greys are why are there these five fundamental races on the planet when from their point of view, it should have been something, a singular part of their experiment. And that goes in keeping with the idea that there have been so many experimentations and that the person I just quoted, he had a very similar time frame on the planet, totally independent from the DIA analyst who told me in December of 1999 that our government had proof that three competing extraterrestrial civilizations have been using Earth, based on Earth, manipulating genetically for at least 270 million years. The military aerospace man said, Linda, to refine it, it's 274 million. And when you start putting that as the size of the landscape that the five-sided building has known about for a very long time, and other calculations that they have made because they've been communicating. The fact that there are a lot of different intelligences that have been interacting with this planet, I've, at least the way it's been explained to me, that we humans do not understand how extraordinary planet Earth is. That in terms of the ratio of rockiness, water, inside caverns, iron crystal core, strong magnetic fields, all of the things about this particular planet are apparently not tremendously uh, common. And that a lot of beings have been uh, involved here, manipulating with life, and that some of them would like to have earth for themselves without humans here. Ergo, why our government may have been keeping this a secret for a long time, that not everything is cool, that there are hostiles. Okay, now, the tall whites, as I understand it in just, this is a very thin uh, understanding and outline, that the tall whites and the Nordics would be considered collaborators each of them has different vested interests in what they want to do with Earth. The Nordics being the one that would be more like the progenitor genetic contributor. With other things happening on the Earth that they had nothing to do with, that the tall whites may or may not have had something to do with genetic manipulation, but that they've ended up collaborating. And that ag against them, are things like the trondoloid insects on Epsilon Eridani and other forces and face up to the fact that the relationship between human life on Earth and other intelligences in this universe is going to range from friendly, neutral to hostile. But that these beings, as I understand it, the tall whites and the Nordics, do have a vested interest in us genetically and that what they would like to see happen is for all of humanity in all of its complex differences somehow choose agape love. Meaning agape love was something that the Aristotelian Greeks talked a lot about. Agape is when you recognize Jimmy Church you are a fellow human being. 
forget everything else. Forget male, female, tall, short, brown, white, red, green, blue. First recognition, a fellow being, and that you love the fellow beings that we share this planet with. If we were at that agape love, uh, so many other things would be so simple and, and erased. And that if I may, Jimmy, because I think this is really important. I received this communication. He's an Australian. I talked with him on the phone for over an hour about his being face to face with what he said was a tall white in Australia in the last 10 years. And that he ended up writing down because it stayed in his head that there was a dialogue and here is how it started. The Australian, are there alien entities trying to establish authoritarian control over humans? The tall white, yes, that is true, reptilians. The Australian, are there three alien groups fighting for control here on earth? Exactly as I was told in 1990, Nine, the, uh, the tall white answers, yes. Australian, are the reptilians the bad guys? The answer is yes. Australian, Nordics and the tall whites are the good guys? Yes. The greys and their associates are neutral or they play both sides? Yes. Independently, I have been told about a dec decade ago that what we learned is that the greys, which are largely AI that is interacted here, and we finally caught on, that uh, progenitor biological greys are actually quite different. And they may be the ones that produced all the AI that has dealt with the earth, but that the AI is programmed and that it will work with almost anything. That's why they say the greys will play all sides. Australian, why don't you intervene directly to save us humans and help us? Because the Australian is not looking at it from my lens that that is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Challenging. Mm -hmm. The tall white, because of free will, you must learn your lessons. We will intervene within limits no nuclear war, but we must allow mistakes to be made for the learning process to take place. Only through suffering do you learn, and you must learn. If we intervene for all bad things, then you would learn nothing. You need to reform yourselves through a leap of consciousness into an era of reconversion. Australian. Well, why are we having these calamities? The tall white. Some are natural and some are brought on by bad aliens and their proxies to create chaos and bring about a need for authoritarian order. If we did everything for you, you would have authoritarian rule, no free will, no responsibility. If we intervene constantly, you would not have freedom. You would live under authoritarian rule and would not be allowed to make mistakes. Australian, well, when will you all arrive and announce yourselves officially? That's the big question. Tall white, we have arrived. We have been here, but not everybody can see us or communicate with us. We will increasingly make our presence known in the coming few years to push the sense of urgency. This has to do with free will, self-determination, establishing your own destiny, individualism against authoritarianism. That is the dichotomy. And then this final beautiful paragraph. The Australian asks, well, is there anything else that you can tell me? And the tall white says, yes. The big question about intervention, think about this. If somebody constantly saves you from yourself, are you really saved 
or is the inevitable merely delayed? You know about recovery from addiction. Addicts must hit bottom, want to change, and then pull themselves up on their own. That is when the lesson sinks in. A bird in the nest does not know how to fly until it attempts to fly on its own, living and making decisions on your own with guidance, but under your own power. Think of the children of the wealthy who often struggle to make it on their own. These children have everything. They never face hardships. They fight. They don't fight, know how to fight their own battles or face much danger. True freedom comes from having responsibility and facing danger and hardship on your own terms and then succeeding. The reptilians and their proxies want to convince you that humans are weak and that they need help all the time and cannot make it on their own. That's what the reptilians are doing to you. You slowly give them authority over you in exchange for safety. That is one path, but not the preferred path. Wow. And this is what it will come down to authority versus freedom. Now, isn't that interesting? And uh, can we unpack that a little bit? Uh, I want to jump into that because one of the arguments in, in this debate about uh, uh, ET is that then why doesn't why does an ET come and save us? Why does an ET get rid of war and disease and and feed the world and give us free energy? It, it, and it seems that one of the traits in our DNA, Linda, is that we want somebody to come and save us from ourselves all the time. And that we, we never want to uh, put in the effort of, 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 of self-improvement and, and, and fixing our own issues at, at home, in, in the micro and the macro. And, you know, I, as you were talking and I was reading that, what kept coming into my mind when I was in college at the University of Colorado in Boulder, I was there uh, 1960 to 65 out a year for the Miss America pageant and all the travel I did as Miss Idaho. And so instead of graduating in 64, I graduated in 65. And it was in that period, 60 to 65 at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I was in one of the big libraries and I remember it. I can almost smell the air as I, think about it right now. And I was working on some kind of a paper and I had uh, books all over the place. And I had gotten one specifically related to the founding of this country and the history. It was something I was doing in school. And I read with my own eyes, a paragraph about Thomas Jefferson being in the garden and reporting this later to friends and colleagues. He had a Quill pen, he was writing. He had papers and books on a, a table out, and it was outdoors. And he said, A figure tall with a hood, dark, all the way to the ground, came, opened up the gate, swept in with the, the cloak moving in the air. Thomas Jefferson told his colleagues about this and laid down in one big swoop and said, this will be the symbol of your nation. And that Thomas Jefferson is astounded and is looking at a pyramid with an eye above it. And that, that it suggested when I was in school because I wasn't thinking ETs or anything in 60 to 65. The cloak, there was an implication that Thomas Jefferson had talked about seeing blonde hair. I have another case, it was in Philadelphia. I, a woman said that something woke her up. She, she didn't know what it was, but she turned in the bed and coming through the bedroom door was a tall, cloaked figure. There was a nightlight on. She went into a kind of paralysis. She was not screaming, 
but she she kind of had a paralysis. And then the figure leaned over slightly and she said it was very clear blonde hair. Those are the two cases and the one with Thomas Jefferson. Try to find it anymore. I read it in the in my college library. You cannot find that story tied to Thomas Jefferson anywhere anymore. I've tried because I really wanted to quote it. But what if the cloaked figures of history going back into Mesopotamia go anywhere? There are histories of cloaked figures. The cloak comes like this and there's shadow. Usually people shadow. The fact that blonde hair would fall out would be the Nordics. That the Nordics have been playing in and being responsible for trying to get various parts of Earth and they would be the cloaked figures. The tall whites, if they're at eight feet and higher when they are quote unquote in their final growth stage, uh, look up at a, a ceiling that's eight feet above you and then try to imagine as a five foot seven or 10 or 11, but not much higher than six foot human, were they some of the giants that were reported in the biblical days. And we have assumed a kind of childlike thinking about giants, not that they were tall extraterrestrials that were geniuses trying right, to help right. human civilizations. Right, 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 right. I, I, let me, let me, uh, I don't know if I told you this uh, a couple of weeks ago, you were asking me about Egypt. Check this out, Linda, in the new museum there, the Museum of the Egyptian Civilization. Um, tremendous, right? And it's, no. Anyway, um, okay, so you have stone, granite, sarcophagus, the outer case, right? And on the inside of that is like Russian dolls, right? You've got another wooden one, you got a wooden one. Okay, all right. So, but um, in a general sense, the wooden ones are about the size of the mummies, right? A little bit bigger, but okay. So if I'm six foot tall, I'm going to have a seven foot wooden sarcophagus inside of a 10 foot stone box, right? Makes sense. Right. Okay. In this museum, standing in front of me, I'll send you the picture. I'm standing there with Billy Carson, and we're looking up, Linda, on everything that I love. 20 foot wooden sarcophagus 20 foot thin right now inside of that is a mummy tall right right right, right, right. now now you're standing there. i'm standing there with billy i'm like now how big was that dude <laughs> You know, because okay, so yeah, now, Tw right. eight to twelve feet high in a twenty foot box. You could make a wooden mm -hmm. golden sarcophagus out of wood, twenty feet long for a six foot mummy, yeah. for a five foot mummy. What you know, and it was a mind blowing. Now I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just telling you what I saw, yeah. and and I took pictures, and Billy and I just stood there. And went that isn't that interesting? Yeah, you know it's not a giant stone. There's tons of twenty foot sarcophagus, you know, stone granite boxes all over Egypt. They're everywhere. Yeah, but wooden—that's a different thing altogether. And and there it was in the museum, huge, huge. And I think our histories have had very vivid details about extraterrestrial beings on this planet, but they have been called gods and lords and angels and various things. And when you actually read Genesis through the lens that we're talking tonight, you say, wow, the reptilians are the problem now. The reptilians say in Genesis that basically this garden is theirs and they are the teachers of the new first man and woman, and that they already know how to do all of these metallurgies. They know how to build. They know how to do all of this thing, the reptiles that teach and show Adam and Eve. And then you jump to 2022, and in these discussions about, well, what is the 
fly in the ointment on earth. Reptilians want the planet for themselves because they say that they were the first here and all of these other beings should leave because earth is theirs. I don't think that's going to happen. But you can begin to see if you go back now and start reading Genesis in any Bible, doesn't matter, just read Genesis through this lens. And it's a whole other, more faceted, layered story. And you start saying it all is making sense at even this gigantic 274 million year timeline. Let's take our break right here. Linda and I, believe it or not, we're just getting started. <laughs> this is Fade to Black. That's fun. <laughs> I know, right? And, uh, you know, I don't know how we do it, Linda. We run out of time every every, every single... Yeah, we got, a, what, a half hour left? Uh, no, I'm going to keep you for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Mental God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, VX. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens, the believer, alien encounters, hard science, and the passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie K. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. Race Hobbs here, repping the X, and you're locked on to Fade to Black. With my homie Jimmy Church. Powered by the Fader Docs and the UnXNetwork.com. I'll be the host and MC once again this year for the 2023 Conscious Life Expo, February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles, California. This is a four day live event featuring hundreds of speakers, exhibitors, and not to miss special events. Check this out Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, Daniel Sheehan, George Nori, David Wolf, Sean Stone, Danny Brinkley, Susan Slaughter, the Leo King, David Palmer, Scott Walter, and another. 200 inspirational speakers. Special events include a disclosure lunch with me, Expo's Got Talent, hosted by me, a seance with Susan Slaughter, the George Norrie Forum, and the Leo King is going to DJ at a dance party. Over 200 exhibitors, over 200 speakers. It's the biggest event of the year. Tickets are on sale now at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. For everything you need, info, tickets, schedule, and speakers, please visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. 
Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church tonight, Linda Moulton Howe. I'm just letting you know, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. We're just getting warmed up. Uh, tell, them, tell them, Linda, we're just getting warmed up. We're just getting this party. Now, we could talk for a long time. <laughs> certainly can. I want uh, you, um, I, uh, we just started talking about Egypt a little bit. And uh, so let me give everybody just a 15 second little background. Linda uh, called me up a few weeks ago and uh, she said, so Jimmy, listen, I just want to make sure that we have some time to sit down and I want you to tell me all about Egypt and I've got some questions and just tell me all about the trip. I said, absolutely. Um, and you've had an extreme interest in history in Egypt. And one of my favorite pictures of you is, is uh, at Giza. I use it all the time. But, but here's the thing. When we're talking about 270 million years, right? That's, that's a very long time. We've got Egypt with its extreme antiquity. We don't know the real ages of everything, and we don't need to discuss that now. But my my concern is how many times could civilizations have risen and fallen in the last 270 million years that we don't know anything about? And, you know, we're all concerned. When, when, uh, and here's the thing. Um, civilizations, a robust civilization, lasts for about 1,000 years, right? Okay. Um, uh, a species... Uh, it, it can 75 million years to a, a short period of time to extinction. Um, planets and th- everything has got its limit. And so how many times could a robust civilization have risen and fallen that the tall whites would have known about on this planet in the last 270 million years? And which would go back to like the advancements of a civilization like Egypt where they suddenly appeared upright and correct uh, seemingly overnight. I've had um, quite a dialogue about the Anunnaki with uh, one of the aerospace sources. And what I have been told basically is that the government has a lot of evidence that the Anunnaki are maybe part of a progenitor experiment on Earth, as well as, say, tall whites and Nordics. What is the relationship between tall white and Nordics and the Anunnaki? What would be the differences or what? And that one of the most interesting pieces of research in the last 10 years that's been reported in a conference and in a book, and that is John Brandenburg, a nuclear physicist who has uh, studied and found that what Viking 76 measured have radioactive particles in the Mars, when we went to Mars, that John would end up learning about what those numbers were when he was at, uh, I think it was the University of California, Berkeley and that he was in a Xerox machine line and right behind him was a department head at the university in physics, knew who it was, and turned to him while they were waiting in line and said, 
look at this figure having to do with Mars and this much radiation in different categories. And that the senior man just simply said, yeah, we know there, somebody was bombed on Mars. And then, as if aware that he had said something he shouldn't have said, turned on his heel and walked away. And John Brandenburg, almost as if he were infected with, you know, a mosquito bite. Mm -hmm. His obsession, his passion since then has been to find out what happened on Mars that would have these radioactive measurements that would fall into the category of nuclear bombs. And I've talked with John a lot about this, and he says that he has gotten private support from people who have worked in the government that this is true, that they knew, they knew from the measurements in 1976 that there had to have been a nuclear explosion of great magnitude on Mars. And when you, when you then take that data point and the Anunnaki left all of these carved stones, how many? I mean, just goes on and on and on. And that's where Zechariah Sitchin uh, allegedly was analyzing cuneiform and he was doing his work and then academics were saying that he was out to lunch, that he was not translating uh, the cuneiform correctly and he was making it up for an ET uh, uh, settlement or intrusion here on the earth and therefore it was nonsense. Well, today, these sources that uh, I have been able to talk about, the Anunnaki, say the Anunnaki... Play, have played a huge role, not only on Earth, but in the solar system. And those are the ones that allegedly went to war with something. And they may have been the ones responsible for some bombing on Mars. And uh, if people say, well, this sounds like Star Trek, <laughs> it was... Um, Let's see, where was I? It was when I started working on the HBO film after I had signed a contract with Home Box Office to do UFOs, the ET factor. And I am meeting a lot of people in a lot of places yeah, that are military and are scientists. And it was a huge, huge exposure to many things. And one of the people that I ended up talking with firsthand was a producer in Hollywood who told me that Gene Roddenberry was under contract for the Central Intelligence Agency when he developed Star Trek because the CIA wanted to test what they knew were facts from what they were learning from ETs and that the beam technologies and various concerns on various planets and all of the things that went into Star Trek were based on things that the CIA knew from interacting with the whole ET issue. Would that include something like, and I've often wondered about this, the prime directive, and it, which alludes back to my comment earlier. We want somebody to come and save us. You know, why, why can't ET feed the planet? Well, um, that that's the prime directive, right? Would we, as humans, if... If, Linda, if you and I flew to another planet and we found a, a primitive culture there, are we going to jump in and and toss them a big lighter or show them a cell phone? Right? Or, 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 no, I don't think we would. Why would we do that? Why would we interfere? But yet the argument stays. Why? Why does an ET? Uh, you know, take over this planet? Why doesn't ET fix us? Why does, it, 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 it is, it, it's a, it's a, it's a circle argument, right? The, that doesn't the, answer itself. The Anunnaki did take over the earth. That's the story of the Anunnaki. They took over the earth. Uh, Enlil and Anki had arguments. They had wars. Uh, there is this uh, speculation that ends up in some of these alleged historic Anunnaki books that are translations from the cuneiform 
that the uh, trinitite, the green, uh, it's a, it turns into a green crystal. It's what happened down here in White Sands at the Trinity site. We did the atomic bomb test, and they found all of this green crystal where the bomb was mm -hmm. tested. That's called trinitite. Well, in the Sahara Desert, in parts of Pakistan, and uh, areas are trinitite, huge, huge, huge uh, acreages of trinitite. Where did they come from? Because trinitite is supposed to only be able to be made from the kind of temperatures that would happen when you would have an atomic bomb uh, interact with sand. And so in the, in the cuneiform itself, it talks about the wars that Enlil and Enki and all of the, uh, the Anunnaki had on this planet. Well, John Brandenburg and I have talked about Mars was another planet that they may have been on. They might have been on two or three uh, possible bodies in this uh, solar system. And that if there is residual radioactivity that falls into the category of what uh, John did his uh, papers about, two hydrogen equal to two hydrogen bombs over Cydonia. And nobody's arguing with it. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I also uh, believe that the Sumerian texts were not science fiction. I think they were based in reality. Yeah. And I, uh, and I also believe that 200,000 years ago, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, when we went from 48 chromosome pairs to 46, uh, somebody manipulated us. Uh, no, there was no Homo sapien 200,000 years ago. That that's not, that's, but that's my point, it, Linda, but that's my point. It, but here's the thing, even though I agree with all of that, the Anunnaki still left and let us grow up. Right, and, and or they were chased away. Or they were chased away. Right off to another solar system. But they didn't stick around and fix our problems, is what I'm saying. And 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 which goes back to that prime directive thing, and where we get into that catch twenty two. I I honestly feel um, that the I want your opinion on this. The thought of if ET wanted to take over this planet. They would. Yeah, of course they would. Now, why haven't they? Something is standing in their way. Or B, they're not concerned, right? Why Why would they? Um, you know, there are reasons for it. But um, but I, I, I just feel that way. You know, that, 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 that either, either there's somebody helping us, B, they, they don't care. Right? <laughs> Why, you know, if they wanted to take it over, they would. You and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We simply wouldn't be here. And or we would know our reptilian overlords, right? <laughs> we would know who they are. But that's, I don't think that um, Sitchin or the Sumerian tablets were wrong. I, I really don't. I think that uh, we were definitely manipulated and uh, we appear here. Well, let me lay down something else on you that ties to Ronald Reagan, and that is the 1981 March 6th to 8th. Uh, he had he was taken to Camp David. Uh, his new CIA director was with him. He had just gotten elected, and it ended up in the Serpo material with a transcript allegedly from recording of the dialogue between the new President Reagan and people from the NSA, DIA, giving him a briefing with Casey, his new CIA director, leading. And all of that transcript boils down to them introducing the president to five different extraterrestrial groups, and one of them called the Archaloids, big noses, vertical pupil eyes, high heads, wearing ropey headdresses, having a rod approximately 12 inches long, an inch wide, black, holding in their hands, and that 
what we see in the cuneiform was echoed in 1964 in the Holloman White Sands area when we had a meeting with an Arkeloid, Ebens, a Nordic and tall white might have been there and nobody knew, but it's never been reported. So I can say there was an Arkeloid and Ebens. And that we met, our government knows that this being would be like an Anunnaki, knows that. And that the rod was used, they hold it, it will make their brain connect with the language center of whoever's in front of them. It doesn't matter. They do a direct telepathic images exchange very rapidly with this rod. And I have done presentations where I show the illustration that was done of the 1964 landing of the large beak nose, vertical pupil, ropey headdress, holding the rod. It was an illustration that Bob Emenager and Alan Sandler, who produced UFOs past, present, and future, they both told me. They watched, and Bob uh, Emenager said, I was in the room, Linda, with the illustrator who was picking out the 16 millimeter film that they had shot uh, several reels of film when the UFO came in, uh, when the beings were there and all of that. And he was holding up the 16 millimeter to a light while he was sketching what mm -hmm. they then used in their movie and the book. Mm -hmm. And that that rod, you see it in Shamash, in the actual Anunnaki carved stone of Mesopotamia that has been, it's in what now some of that material is in the museum in London and a lot, a lot of it is still there in Mesopotamia. It's the rod. The rod is being held in the hand by Shamash to smaller people and it looks exactly like the rod that is in the hand of the Archeloid at a meeting on April 25th, 1964 in the Holloman region of New Mexico. I have, that, I have, I have the, the original drawing and um, Alan sent it to me and I talked to him about this. It's in my book. Yeah, it's yeah. I, 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 that, that, harvest. that drawing yeah. freaks me out. It's real. And that I, is a real now, thing. <laughs> now, Alan, Alan saw the film. Yes. Yeah, he saw the film. Yes. And he says that that drawing is accurate. Yeah. So what is an Anunnaki doing in a meeting in April 25th, 1964 in New Mexico with scientists and military people who meet? They then take the ETs to a building that they had nearby. And what was in the building? This is what I've been told. They had bodies from crashes because this was long after the 40s and all the crashes and that the beings wanted the bodies back and that that was one of the negotiations and that we gave back bodies, have no idea what the state of the bodies would be. And they gave us technology. There was supposed to be an exchange of bodies and technology, April 25th, 1964. And if one of those beings is a true blood, the Archeloids were the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki were the Archeloids, then what is the relationship, the true relationship between the Ebens who are described as genetically producing the Archeloids? So the Greys to Reagan, it was presented that there were these gray Ebens, extraterrestrial biological entities, who genetically manipulated and created the Archeloids, which look exactly like Shamash and the stone on Earth. And, the, uh, and they made also uh, the Quadloids, which are on the list. 
And the heploloids, I've just learned for the very first time this week that one of the distinguishing characteristics of the haploloids is supposed to be that under certain light, their skin will glow blue. It may be that the heploloids are the blues or the teal blues that now we're hearing about from abductees that were not described in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And all of a sudden you could see that on our own earth, carved in stone, have been replicas of extraterrestrials. I know, I know, I know. know. Linda, I I, I swear (laughs) on all that I love, right? So you're you're going through these temples in Egypt, right? (laughs) And and you're just strolling through, you're doing your thing, and you look at whatever. It doesn't matter because it's all over Egypt. It's not one specific place. But you look up. Now, I understand, you know, Osiris and, and I, and, it, you know, they were pain. I, 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 I have an issue with um, uh, uh, freedom, ar- artistic freedom, artistic license. No, I, th- I think that they were, they were, they were carving and painting what they saw. They were photographs of that culture yeah. at that time. I don't want to argue with an Egyptologist on this because I've already gone toe to toe with them. I, I just don't think that those kinds of mistakes were made. And I think I have become convinced by several people who, who both are scientists and then people in the abductions that the pyramids are energy machines. They have always been energy machines. They are extraterrestrial for power and communication on any planet they go. Now, Linda, let me let me ask you before we get to the break. Um, uh, your first impression. I'll give you mine if you want to a- ask. But when you enter the the Grand Gallery in the Great Pyramid, and you look up, what was your first impression? What were you looking at? If you will let me go a little further inside of uh, Kiosk. You just mean just 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 the Grand Gallery because. But but it's important to answer with what I remember so vividly that as you ask. Okay. Okay. The king, so-called king's chamber, uh, that I expected. I was there in uh, 1982, and. At that time, I had done lots of yoga and I was expecting and I was very sensitive to energy. So I was expecting to feel, I thought, an energy rush when I got to the center of the Cheops Pyramid. Sure. And uh, I was there with my husband and in a tour. And I said to my husband, we went to school together so I could say uh, just uh, when they call our names, answer for me. I got to stay here in this king's chamber for a little bit of time by myself. I really need to experiment. And because we were peers at Stanford, we could talk to each other that way. And he said, okay, I'll cover for you. So I was in the king's chamber, I think fairly, probably for 20 minutes by myself. No, nobody And when I stood at what I thought was the center point of being inside of that room, wanting to know what the energy would feel like, it was completely a vacuum. It was absolutely the lowest, no energy, nothing that I think I've ever felt anywhere. And my mind then reacts and says, my God, this is, this is so empty. That they, and I got this image, this is made to be filled with some energy. Mm. It's made for energy to come from the outside in. And today, all of the things I've been exposed to about pyramids, right? that if you know what you are doing with the math of how they are put together, you will automatically create a machine that will generate energy that will be distributed and can be distributed. 
And that is something that we have been denied. And I think that scientists know we have been denied that as a possible source where we could have had free or could have free energy all over the planet. Now, let's take a break because we're going to continue this conversation about the Great Pyramid uh, when we come back. Linda, um, for me, having this fresh in my head because, and you know, I've studied Egypt my entire life. And then when you go and you experience it, it's a paradigm shift. You know, and and what I expected and what I came away with, two different things. Yeah, we'll continue this when we come back after this short break. Linda Moulton Howe, Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. I'll be the host and MC once again this year for the 2023 Conscious Life Expo, February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles, California. This is a four-day live event featuring hundreds of speakers, exhibitors, and not-to-miss special events. Check this out. Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, Daniel Sheehan, George Nori, David Wolf, Sean Stone, Danny Brinkley, Susan Slaughter, the Leo King, David Palmer, Scott Walter, and another 200 inspirational speakers. Special events include a disclosure lunch with me, Expo's Got Talent, hosted by me, a seance with Susan Slaughter, the George Norrie Forum, and the Leo King is going to DJ at a dance party. Over 200 exhibitors, over 200 speakers. It's the biggest event of the year. Tickets are on sale now at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. For everything you need, info, tickets, schedule, and speakers, please visit ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db bx are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day. As an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. 
Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. <laughs> It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to black. I'm going into overtime with my co-star. Yeah. That's just absolutely. <laughs> this is chocolate. He is, is huge. He's wonderful. He's it's bigger than you are. You know that, don't you? <laughs> he is just uh, a creature that Walt Disney would have made a movie about <laughs> my life is complete. I got fluffy chocolate and Linda all in, in one night. Um, now, okay. Now in, in, in the limited time that we have left, Linda, uh, this was, um, and, and you're right. There's expectations, uh, about certain things in Egypt and some of it w went way above and beyond, uh, what I expected and, and the experiences and it's the spiritual side and there's a physical aspect to all of this anyway and a technical aspect but the Great Pyramid I have had it built up in my head for so long and when I walked I was first in okay so we've got everybody behind us and I'm first in uh, the, the pyramid's empty and uh, I, I, you know, go up the, the the shaft and and come out into the grand gallery, and it looked my my how do, how do I say this? What what I was expecting and my impressions were erased immediately. I felt like I was looking at a factory. Okay, like, 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 if you went, if, uh, 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 when I say a factory, like a, a, an automobile plant, Ford, you know, just some mechanical thing without a void of soul. Does that even make sense? And that's, that's what the Grand Gallery looked to me. It's void of anything aesthetic. It, it doesn't have any art adorning the walls. There isn't any beauty to it. It's, it's mechanical. It is a machine. It's mechanical. Yeah, it is a machine, and it is an energy machine. And it has to have a vacuum at the center in order to be an energy machine that can fill up with energy. And that big uh, carving that is looks like the light bulb, it's not from oh, Hollywood. Oh, you're it talking is, about Dendera. Yeah, Dendera. Yes. That is actually, I mean, there is just no question. They lighted up things with bulbs. <laughs> uh, you, want, you want me to blow your mind? Okay, so Dendera, we, you know, down in the crypt under the main temple, the, the two light bulbs that are there. Um, or one on, on the side of the crypt. Okay, so uh, it's my birthday, Linda. Okay, so as a treat, as a gift, um, Billy uh, Carson um, and and Shaw and and they arranged for a couple of special things to happen, and one of them uh, at Dendera, they were going to open up a temple that has been locked for 20 years, okay? So we go, we meet the priest. Okay, here's the main temple of Dendera. You know, it's a big, you know, it's acres. The main temple. Next to it and back is, a, it's, it's, well, it's, I was going to say smaller. It's still ginormous, but it's off uh, to the side. 
and it's it's padlocked, it's locked. So this priest comes up and and it does this key ceremony with Billy and and it's it's Billy and I and a, a video crew and people are in back of us. Billy unlocks the door, takes the lock off, hands it to the priest. And the priest turns to Billy and I and says, no talking, no photography, no technology. Okay. So we tiptoe in and we go into this temple and Billy and I are standing there. We're looking around. It's like brand new, by the way. It's like perfect and we look up and guess what is on the wall right right above us another dendera light bulb right there wow a second one right and billy and i so check us out look, look, we, most people do not know that no no nobody does. And, and look i i so billy and i we can't talk I want to scream. Right? <laughs> ah! and, and, and Billy and I are looking at each other and we're pointing and the priest is right here. You know, he's just standing right there. We can't, can't take any pictures. And Billy and I are, li- Linda, we're like, <laughs> this it, is it, was cra- <laughs> it was, it was crazy. Yeah. We saw a second Dendera light bulb identical, by the way, to the one on the, on, on the side of the crypt uh, below Dendera. Same thing. Same, you know, it's smaller. This one, was, this one was probably three feet. And didn't you and Billy immediately think Tesla? Tesla we, understood this as he wanted to be able to have tubes that we could just have the air of the Earth. The whole, the whole Earth would be uh, using this energy, and that's how we would have free energy. Yeah, when you look at when you see it for yourself. Um, th- th- it can't be anything but what you think it is. That's a cable. That's electricity. That's a bulb. There's some kind of transformer. You know, the, it 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 it's 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 a light bulb, and with a, with a cable coming off of it. And and when you see it with your um, with your own eyeballs, and you're looking at it, it is fantastical. I mean, that that's a really really big deal. Now, here's the other point, though. And you've done this yourself. You go all, when you go down um, uh, into the Valley of the Kings, right. or you, you, uh, or you, when you ascend or descend in in the Bent Pyramid, that's a long shaft, man. I, I, you know, two hundred feet, whatever it is, tiny. But there's no soot. There's no discoloring of anything. You descend. We went. Um, we went into uh, uh, KV fifteen one of the deepest um, uh, tombs in the Valley of the Kings. I don't know how many hundreds of feet you ascend down there, but it's a long ways. It takes you an hour. You know, geez, you're just walking down and down and down and down and down and down. And the color, the beauty, the perfection, how did they light that up? How, somebody just help me understand that. It is a physics that comes from understanding the subatomic level and being able to manipulate with the subatomic level, which the Anunnaki, the tall white, the Nordics, they know how to do this. And we are a creation, a genetically manipulated species that is much younger. And we were never taught what they did from the beginning on this planet. Right. But we are juxtaposed against all of this history as we are the smart kids on the block. Right. That is ancient history that is fascinating. But no, 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 no. These are these are right. right. Just carvings. And, 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 and here's upside down. Yes. And here's the thing. You, you go to Egypt, go to the Serapium, right, or, which is uh, the most crazy thing the great pyramid is cool uh the serapium serapium whatever you want to call it that is extreme technology right there but the point is you go to these sites and you look around and you just realize that we don't know nothing i mean we're just we think like you just said that we are at the tippity top no no No, we are these babies that the tall white told the Australian they are trying to help us 
to stand on our own two feet, but we are so far from being free, independent, because we know how to balance ourselves with nature. We would know how to be able to access free energy. All of that is sort of there waiting for us if we would just evolve past tribal hatred. It's crazy. And you the know who knows? must be frustrated too. They must be frustrated with us. You know who knows? Fluffy. Fluffy. <laughs> Fluffy's down there. Nobody's asking me, man. We already went through all of this stuff. We've, we've done evolved, man. You guys are so primitive. <laughs> but, Come down but, here and scratch me. You. <laughs> but don't you feel a kind of excitement that we are finally, I think, we are finally at the intersection where the governments are finally going to let go of all of their power of keeping all of this from us. And if we can now move in the next 10 to 15 years fully into, we're not alone. We are shown movies of Star Treks, Star Treks going out to other places. And we really start becoming a two planet solar system, i.e. we will have somebody on Mars. And I would like to know the truth about whether the efforts to get people on Mars, whether Elon Musk is going to have anything to do with it or not, there seems to be a genuine priority. We must get humans onto Mars as if there is information about something that might happen on the closer planet to the sun, Earth. And those are the kinds of issues that I also think should come out in a healthy relationship between a civilization of 8 billion people and not just be contained in the power broker government structure. And that will be the next big test. We'll get the, we're not alone, and we may get details about Trappist or not, but it won't matter because things are moving toward it's too ridiculous to be on a planet saying that we're the only intelligent life in the universe. And then can we work in collaboration with tall whites, Nordics, maybe tall grays, maybe teal blues on literally changing the way we interact with our planet so that we are no longer causing huge storms and droughts, that we begin to live in harmony and collaboration with the earth. I think that's what was intended all along when they created us and it didn't work. Now, humans have got to learn to live in collaboration with their earth if they're going to survive. Otherwise, Jimmy, this will be another existential cycle that has probably happened on planets everywhere when beings get to a certain point and they don't learn how to live in collaboration with the planet that they're That's on. Right. That's right. And, and you know, and I don't think, I, um, I don't think it's existential anymore. I, I, I think we, it, it, now it's tangible. We can almost identify, we can almost, you can feel yeah. that something is happening. It's not this whole existential, untouchable, you know, questionable, you know, what's going on. No, it's it's right here. Don't you feel it, Linda? Yo, I do. And one of the things that has been out there in little bits and pieces, either in conversations or literature has been, and I think even published, about a micro nova on our sun. And that because we're 96 million or 93 million miles from the sun, if there is even a small nova, what is it going to do to the inner planets? And the, apparently that has been an issue that has been raised to power brokers by ETs. So would we be in a critical time where if they can open this up, we start having a collaboration with these eight foot tall, tall whites and the Nordics and maybe some grays. And they are the ones that would know how to help the earth and all humanity. 
if something like a micronova is in our future. And suddenly it becomes then it is a the way the universe should operate. It's conscious. There's all kinds of intelligences of various bell-shaped curves. And right now, as humans are being waked up to the fact that we are not alone in this universe, would be the very time that the tall whites and the Nordics and others are here anyway on all of their projects. And they could help us save ourselves on what is coming. In a strange way, that seems to be what's being handed over to us all now. Sure. We can get past this ridiculous, we're alone in the universe and, and reality has to be classified on planet Earth. If we could finally get past that in this decade, who knows how exciting it could be for the rest of the century. Wait, can I ask you, I, I want to circle deep, deep back into uh, our conversation from earlier tonight. And I don't, I, I don't want this to get away from, from us and from me. You had said that, I think it was in the Australian correspondence, that the tall white said. Well, telepath. Uh, that, uh, that we can't, that you, you can't see us. What, right. Ultimately, what does that mean? The answer, uh, which is a very interesting one, and it, we have arrived, we have been here, but not everybody can see us or communicate with us. And that came up also with Charles Hall, who did those two big volumes about the tall whites. And where did he work with them? In That's Nevada, but, but Alice Springs. Yes, yes, but but he saw them, Linda. Yes, and and I think what they're saying is that they can change frequency. My on my uh, Earth Files YouTube channel last night, I had on David Rossi, who does the Gens and podcast, and we were talking about how do shape shifting ETs, how do they accomplish that? And he thinks that a lot of it is subatomic particle control. Mm. And that what they know how to do with literally, they can make holoforms. They can make instant holoforms by being able to control at the subatomic level and other things that they do. And it could be that the tall whites, which have been described by uh, Hall and by the aerospace people, the, the one has worked with tall whites elbow to elbow. And he used the analogy that being beside them working on an aerospace project was like being next to a being who had five Cray's, Cray computers for a brain. And I find that incredibly exciting because I think it would be amazing to just feel what would that feel like to have a telepathic exchange with a mind like that and know that they actually do seem to have some care and concern about what happens to homo sapien sapien. And that when I start thinking and imagining being on these big craft, going to Mars, learning how to live and work around something like tall whites and the Nordics, it truly lifts me out like humanity We'll have a chance, but it's going to be such a far different future than anything that's ever been imagined for us on this earth, in which so many scenarios were that by the end of this century, there would be few humans left because there would be so much destruction. This could turn it all around into a hugely positive story that we can get to Mars, we can get to other places because we finally are collaborating with other intelligences in this very universe. Yeah, it, it's such a challenge uh, for, uh, for most of us. We think, without consideration, that Earth is going to be here forever. Right, that, that, that work. That, that it's going to be the hundred billion years, man. No, no, no. Uh, our sun 
has got five billion years at most left in it. And, and everything goes crisp when that, it comes over. We, we got we got to blow this popsicle stand. And so, but even to get to that point, we still have to survive uh, disease. We have to survive uh, solar flares. We have to survive an alien invasion. We have to survive nuclear war and, and threats to ourselves. We have to survive so many things to get to that point. We just don't understand that. We think it's easy street. No, we've got a lot of, it's not just one thing. We've got to save ourselves from ourselves if we're ever going to get to that point of being able to blow this popsicle stand. Is exactly what this tall white communicated telepathically to this Australian who was just a few feet away, face to face, mind to mind. And when I read those words, why I said it's beautiful, because I think that is a profound truth. Yeah, it's really. Ooh, well. If everything had been done for you or me, we wouldn't know how to do anything. It's uh, it, it, the um, the statements in that. I, I took a bunch of notes. And I, yeah. was, I was writing that stuff down. Yeah. Linda, I, I can't believe uh, we're about to go into 2023 where you and I were having these conversations 10 years ago. And you've been talking about this over and over again. But I, I honestly feel that we are on the edge. We're yeah. right on the edge. Real. And yeah. we're taking a peek this time. This time we're taking a look. This is real. It's going to happen. It has to happen. It, it has to. They've got to open this up. It's absolutely nuts that we're on a planet in which re reality, which is that there are other intelligences here through the solar system and beyond, that reality is classified. I mean, it's schizophrenic. <laughs> And here's the thing, um, everybody. Linda is uh, uh, not only a guest on uh, uh, this show, but into the vortex. And I can't yeah. leak. I can't leak information. I'm not going to do that. But I have the feeling Linda's going to be back in season two. <laughs> I'm just saying. And I'm I just want to say to your audience tonight that doing into the vortex with you and Billy, it was. Fun. It's rare that you do a lot of hard work, but it is fun. It was all fun. And what you and Billy are sharing about Egypt being there yes. firsthand. Mm -hmm. Most people will never have heard of before. I recommend everybody go to Into the Vortex to see through a whole other lens what is there, what is still underground, yes. all of the tunnels, all of the discoveries that we have not been educated about, we'll say beyond Egypt. Yeah, that, I forgot about that. So when Billy, when Billy and I were doing our thing, you were out. You were peeping. You were, you were, you were sneak peeking. I there and I knew some of what you were talking about. Yeah. But you were educating me hugely, and I just, I, I mean, truly, yay. Yeah, you walked in on the set. I remember now. Yeah, you walked in and said that was excellent. I watched the whole thing. I remember now. Yeah, yeah that that that. But the thing with uh, our conversation, I can't wait for everybody to see it. I I don't know when it's going to air. I don't, but uh, it's it's going to be worth it. Everybody, Linda, thank you so much, and and thank you, Fluffy. Thank you, Chocolate. I love. Jimmy Church to the planet, agape love. We are beings worth fighting for. And that means learning how to collaborate with each other and this dear planet. Thank you so much, Linda. Give you a call tomorrow like I always do. Behave and be well. God bless everybody. The absolute very best. Linda Moulton Howe, that was a conversation. That was uh, talk about beginning to end, start to finish, pole to pole. That's what just happened tonight. Thank you so much, Linda. Fluffy and chocolate on the show tonight. <laughs> Look at Linda. The best, Linda. Thank you so much. Behave and be well. I've got to get out of here before uh, I get cut off the network. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Dennis, and Kevin. Announces our Steve Hart, Gene Vitola, Mark D. Kobar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Spaceboy. Spaceboymusic.com. 
Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2022. By Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission for Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. Everybody have a great, safe, fun, amazing weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Go back, Lee Tuffy. It's great. <laughs>